Hello, and welcome to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour on HCAM TV. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Tuesday, and it is Dr. Kavanaugh live, taking your questions about the upcoming school year. And as we all know, there has been a flurry of information and a lot of questions, and we're very grateful for our audience for tuning in and asking our questions. So we're going to be sharing some of those. However, hello, Carol. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. Pleasure to be here, as always. All right. Now, we did get a bunch of questions that we forwarded you that we didn't get to in the last show. And I know you, you had a very, very successful in terms of in terms of reaching people forum last Thursday. Did you hear any numbers from that? I don't think I did, actually. There were roughly 15, 14 to 1500 people who watched that live, whether part of your webinar or on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. So, and we've had over 3,000 views um, on, on those media, and that does not include the people who actually see it on our television channel. So it, it's, uh, we're, we're getting connected out there. So that's really good. Yes, thank you for doing this. Uh, I know that parents are very concerned about what next year is going to look like and the quality of education. And yesterday was a big deadline for parents, you know, in that they had to decide if they wanted remote instruction or if they wanted the hybrid model. And I just want to say thank you to parents for making decisions in what I know felt like a very short period of time because. Now today what's happening in the buildings is the principals are sitting there now sifting through an awful lot of information about the families who want hybrid, those who want remote, the special education students who want to come every day, the ones who do not want to come every day. And you know we had schedules in place in the spring that are now all being dismantled. Um, I know parents are going to be asking questions such as, are my children going to continue to move up with their familiar peers? And I know that in the spring, we worked very hard to make sure that kids were traveling to the next grade level with familiar peers, for example. And I think today we're, we're working hard to keep those intact while we're also dismantling some of them. So I'm just asking for people's patience. It's very, very hard to get all of this in place in a short period of time. Excellent. Now, before we get into some of the new questions that are that are coming in now, do you want to address any of the larger themes or some of the uh, interesting questions that you've been getting that you would like to address? I would love to have an opportunity to talk with parents about scheduling because I know that they are... You know, I think it's very clear in building principals' minds and in the assistant superintendent, superintendent's minds about what would a typical day look like for a high school student or a Hopkins student, but it's not so easy, I think, for parents to understand that. So I would very much like to just show a couple of mock-up schedules um, to parents if I can take the screen. Um, one thing I would like to say is that all of these schedules do need to be negotiated with the teachers union. So these are not the definitive schedules. These are just ideas that we have in place right now as to how would we be able to address in-person learning needs as well as remote learning needs. So if that's okay, Jim, would you be all right with that? Please share your screen. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. All right, I am going to start with this high school schedule that you can see right here. Uh, what you are seeing before you, and this would be if we had an alphabetical split. We don't actually have a perfect alphabetical split. But if we did, A to L would come one day, M to Z would come another day. So again, this is hypothetical. But A to L would be part of the Green Day cohort, and M to Z would be part of what we're calling the Orange Day cohort. So when a student arrives to school on the A day, for example, I'm an A day in-person student, say for example, from 725 to 825, I go to my English class, maybe. When the bell rings at 825, Mr. Bishop clearly does not want 600 students just wandering the halls. So what we've built in here, or what I should say is what Mr. Bishop has built in here, is a 15 minute stretch of time for passing time and for mask breaks. So students, some students in the building would be able to proceed to the outdoors, to be able to take their masks off for a couple of minutes, get a little bit of fresh air, put your mask back on and go on to your second period class. Uh, while they are doing that, 
some kids would be held here in this first period class. And so is it going to be sort of a perfect science? No. Will there be a little bit of pooling up, you know, in a hallway outside of this, this classroom perhaps? Yes, there, there might be. Um, but what will eventually happen is that, you know, we will we'll keep kids moving without them all moving at once. And we'll be able to let kids get some mask break time. So then again, a kid may go to his second period class, which is a math class, and then have a mask break, then maybe have social studies. And somewhere in this big block right here, you have a an opportunity to eat lunch and take a break. Um, as people who have high school age students know, we have multiple lunches that would fall into this period. So sometimes you go to lunch and sometimes you go to class and sometimes you go to class, then you go to lunch, then you go back to class, or sometimes you go to class and then you go to lunch. Do you have the first lunch, a middle lunch or a last lunch? Kids would then again have passing time and mass break and then they'd have another class. So you can see in this mock-up right here, there are actually five one hour classes all day with three built-in times for passing time and mask break. At lunch, there would also be again time for a mask break. And this will show you a 14 day rotating cycle. Now I've had a lot of parents who have said to me, okay, so if I'm a green kid and now on the orange day, what am I doing? Are you really just assigning me homework? And that homework is kind of a day's instruction. And so I really wanted to talk a little bit about what could happen on an A day so that parents will see that there is actual learning taking place. So let's imagine that in my, my first period class, my English class on the green day, I'm still in the green cohort, and my class is reading To Kill a Mockingbird. When I go home, I have been given this assignment and it's all available to me as well through Schoology, so it's all one-stop shopping. I know exactly where to find it if I'm looking for it. I open it up, it tells me that I need to read the chapter um, on the Cunninghams and the Yules, two white families in the book To Kill a Mockingbird, who although they are white and living in the South and impoverished, have different sort of value systems. So I read those, and then the teacher has left for me in Schoology a graphic organizer. I take the information out of the text, I fill it into the graphic organizer, and now I'm ready for my lesson for the day. My lesson for the day is not the homework that I just did. My lesson for the day is to get into a Zoom session with three peers. I do this independently. I don't need my teacher. And we talk about the patterns that we're seeing among those two families and the similarities and the differences based on what's in the graphic organizer. Perhaps as a group of three or four students, we write up two paragraphs. We submit those into Schoology. And we've actually done a whole lot of learning on that particular day. So I will stop my sharing right there for a moment so that we can talk a little bit about, you know, what some of the other learning might look like. So in my science class, I might get a, or my math class, I might get a Khan Academy video or a video of my teacher teaching a particular lesson, and then I do some independent work. So I want people to know that kids aren't just sitting at home doing homework, they are having asynchronous learning. All right, so I will just show you very, very quickly, I promise what it would look like if you were a Hopkins grade four. And this time you're not one of the kids going into school, which is what I just showed for the high school. But imagine that you are one of the students who elected to have remote instruction. And once again, I don't want people to think that this is a carved in stone um, kind of a schedule because this would have to be negotiated with the teachers association. But you know, one of the things that can happen here is so kids will sign into Zoom with a teacher first thing on Monday morning and from 8.15 to 8.35 for 20 minutes, the kids will have morning meeting. This is exactly what would happen if you were sitting in the Hopkins school in person. Between 9.35 and nine o'clock, there will be a writing mini lesson. And um, then there will be sort of a little bit of a 15 minute break between nine and 9.15. Kids could continue working independently on that writing mini lesson. If there's some work to do, they can get up and get a snack, they can use the bathroom, but there is a nice little break built in right here. Not dissimilar from the one that was happening if you looked at the high school one. Now what happens here next is, so students in this particular class would have a special next, and this particular special is health class. So from 9.15 to 9.35, the student is meeting with the health teacher by Zoom, but from 9.35 to 9.55, they have asynchronous learning with a health teacher. Then these kids know that they have a 
uh, project-based learning assignment in social studies. They are working that on that on their own. That can be pushed out to them by Schoology. And they are working here all by themselves all the way from 9.55 when the ACE Rink and Risk Health Work Health Assignment finishes to 10.30. At 10.30, so between 10.30 and 11.15, what we see starting to happen here for 45 minutes is a reading workshop. So kids would be engaging in reading mini lessons. And I won't go too much further in this. There's an independent writing, and then there's a science lesson via Zoom. But you can see that in the remote learning, there are you know, very carefully planned lessons, and kids are on Zoom and off of Zoom, and on Zoom, and off of Zoom, and on Zoom. And this would happen for this particular student all week. So when they'd go back on Tuesday for their morning meeting, this time they go to math as opposed to writing. On this day, their special is, or related arts, is library. It would happen via Zoom, and it would happen at 10 o'clock instead of 9.15. So I really did just want to show people that the in-school and the out-of-school lessons are not all that dissimilar. And now we can start with the barrage of questions. All right, thank you. Thank you for indulging that. I appreciate it. Okay, that's good information. And we'll make sure yeah. that the proper video gets up. Great, thank you. The original talking point for a hybrid in-person learning was that the infection rate and transmission rate in children were less than adults. Now that the talking points have been proven false with many studies and what is happening with children in Florida, who are on vacation and not necessarily in enclosed space for a full long period of time, why is the school still pushing the hybrid model? Now, I do think, I, I would like to add on that. I think it's very interesting that there are school districts who have already started. And I would, I'd be interested in any information that you're following for that as well. Yes. So yes, we are getting new scientific research that is proving that kids are carriers of COVID-19. Um, some of them will show symptoms, some of them will not. Uh, I guess what our plan is in going forward with the hybrid model is, you know, it is our belief that the, the very best education is that very personalized education that happens between a teacher and a student. And so we are moving ahead with this. We will make sure that our people are practicing social distancing, that they're wearing the appropriate PPE, that they are sitting on in a one seat in the bus, that they're six feet apart anytime they have their masks off, for example, for lunch. We'll make sure that they get good mask breaks. And, you know, I really believe that we have given parents choice in either hybrid or remote. And I think just showing those two schedules indicates that kids are going to be getting the same thing whether they're in school or out of school. Um, there are just some parents who like to have their children in that brick and mortar setting. Uh, one of the conversations we've had recently with the Commissioner of Education is that you know, if we start to see the virus spike in Massachusetts or if we start to have you know, an outbreak in a particular classroom or a particular school or a particular district, we can easily shut our schools down. So I understand that you know some people are are weighing that whole idea of you know are we what are we gaining by sending our kids to the brick and mortar setting what are we risking by sending our kids to the brick and mortar setting and you know it really has been an individual family decision to make. Great. By the way, I'm curious. Yesterday was a deadline for people to select. Yes. Do you have? Any, any numbers on that? How many people have selected to start remotely and how many people have selected to start hybrid? We do. So the, and, and I wanna thank families again for making that decision. You know, people, I, I bet I've spoken to hundreds of parents over the last weekend. And you know, I think my messaging to them is neither one of these models is ideal. You know, the ideal would be there isn't a pandemic and we are running the Hopkinton Public Schools as we always have. But I know families had really difficult decisions to make. In the end, what we're looking at right now is about 27% of the families have opted to go remote and 83% have opted to do the hybrid. Okay, thanks. No, 73%, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Anne asks, what will my child's day look like at Marathon? I heard there are going to be desks. Will they be sitting at their desks for most of the day? Uh, so yes, there, there will be desks at the Marathon Elementary School, but I believe that we are also leaving some of the tables in the rooms because, because we can. Um, no, I don't think that a parent has to worry too much about a student sort of being 
you know, tethered to that desk uh, for a long period of time. We understand that five and six year olds need movement. And so each one of the schools is getting a tent. We can get kids outside. As long as kids are six feet apart in a classroom, we can get kids standing and doing movement breaks um, with some frequency. In the high school uh, schedule that you just saw, you saw a 15 minute break there. You know, we'll be building those kinds of breaks in as well. And you know, depending upon space availability, if we can't get kids outside on a nice day, outside for recess, outside under the tent, certainly we'll get them moving in classrooms or in the gym or in the cafeteria or wherever it is that we can get them moving. Um, I think probably some of the most difficult aspects, I think, of teaching with the, the little kids is that, you know, we do a lot of that. We get very close to them and read side by side. Or if a child is having trouble with letter formation, we go hand over hand. So those are going to be the pieces that I think teachers and kids are going to miss the most. You know, if I walk into a first grade classroom on a typical day, there might be a teacher sitting delivering reading to a small group of kids. And I think we can probably still make that happen with the PPE and plexiglass and plexi shields and all of that. But, and, you know, but, you know, you, a lot of times too, when I walk in, I see kids who are working on, you know, tablets or working on, you know, just writing assignments. So there is an awful lot of independent work that happens. And I think we can still socially distance our kids and engage in that. I, I want to caution people if they are wary that there's going to be that old sort of everybody is sitting in a row with the teacher at the front of the classroom and she's delivering whole group instruction. That's that wouldn't be the model at all. We'd still have kids working very independently on, you know, things that are appropriate to them as learners, individual learners. Great. Okay. Jennifer asks, I understand that you're holding a town hall with teachers on Wednesday. Are the school committee members going to be involved in this conversation? Uh, no, so I've had a conversation with school committee. And you know, one of the things that we know about the school committee is that they are responsible for three things. One is establishing the budget, two is establishing policy, and three is setting goals and evaluating the superintendent. So for school committee, in terms of reentry, they are, asked by the con commissioner to vote on Hopkinton's plan. So yes, they would be in charge of saying, if we go back into the classroom, and it is the district recommendation that we have both a hybrid and remote model, which they'll vote on on Thursday night. But you know, at the end of the day, the how we go back into the classroom really is not within their purview. So right now we have sort of the 30,000 foot view. What are we gonna do? And we're doing you know, at least if the school committee votes on it, hybrid every other day and remote. But all of those intricacies about how that happens, that really happens in meetings between the school administration and the Hopkinton Teachers Association. So I feel like that that's a meeting that should be left to building principals and central office administrators, which is with the HTA. Okay. Christine asks, if an HHS student is asked to quarantine for 10 days due to contract tracing, what does the learning look like for those 10 days since his or her teacher may still be in school every day teaching each cohort? Yes, so that's a distinct possibility at the high school because if a person, say for example, you now the kid who sits next to you in your English class who's your very best friend, contracts COVID and you have now been asked to sit at home. Um, one of the things that I would recommend that that student do is to go in getting negative tests. If you get a negative test and the DPH says you can come back, you can come back without sitting out for 10 days. Um, but if you were out for 10 days, we would treat you no differently than if you were a student who you know, had the flu in the winter time and had to be out for 10 days. So yes, we would be pushing work out to you and we would certainly have the teacher communicating with you, um, but we would probably not move you to any kind of a remote model because that would be like taking you out of your classroom and moving you into another one temporarily and then back again. So that probably wouldn't be helpful. Okay. Can Dr. Kavanaugh provide an update on how the negotiations are going with the HTA? We have opted for elected. We have opted for elected remote. So we're curious about how many hours of synchronous teaching have been negotiated and when schedules will be released for the elected remote cohort. In addition to that, there was also a question um, from Darlene asking, "Do you think the teachers' union may demand full remote?" 
Now I know you're in negotiations and negotiations are ongoing. So we, I think we're kind of looking for what you can tell us yeah. how things stand. Yes, of course, what happens in negotiations is entirely confidential. Um, but what I can say is that we are meeting with great frequency. We had a meeting yesterday. We have a meeting tomorrow. Our meetings are usually set up for two hour blocks. And at this point, I think the association and the school department have been working really cooperatively and collaboratively with each other. You know, they obviously have a list of things that are important to them and the schools have a list of things that are important to us. And I think we're just working through them one item at a time. So it's a slow and steady process, but so far it has been an amicable, amicable and cooperative kind of a process. Um, I think that, you know, schedules will be ready as soon as we can get them out to families. It would be our goal for parents to be able to see exactly what their kid's schedule looks like. You know, when I just showed sort of that sample schedule, if, you know, at the high school level, kids are enrolled in seven courses, we'll make sure that they have access to teachers as frequently and for a good length of time as is possible. Okay, this is kind of a follow up with that. I'm gonna put this here. Donna asked, do you have any idea yet when we might learn what cohort our child has been assigned to and what our child's schedule will otherwise be under the hybrid model. Now, the question I wanna ask about this is, you were just saying how negotiations are ongoing. I assume that the HPS and the HTA are not like the Congress of the United States where they wait until the 11th hour for pressure to get something done. And right now we're looking at a start date of September 15th or September 16th? 16th is the proposed date, yes. Okay, so um, what's your feeling on when some of these decisions may be settled and when people may start to try to look for this information? Sure. Um, you know, it's always hard to say in contract negotiations, you know, you talk about the 11th hour, but what's really interesting is, you know, we could have 10 things and they could have 10 things and we would be looking at them. And then sometimes everything goes really well, but then sometimes there's that one final thing that hangs you up. You know, so we're, we're I'm, I'm hopeful at, at this point in time. Um, we could probably get the green cohort, orange cohort information out to parents very, very soon. When, when you saw that sort of sample high school schedule that we had been kind of messing around with, and we had an alpha split that was A to L and M to Z. And then we played around with A to L E, and then, you know, something like, li to everything else would have been but what that did was it set up amazing disparity at each school so in the green cohort for example at marathon there could have been 330 kids and then in the orange there could have been 270 and we couldn't have a 60 student difference uh, but when we got to an al to li to, to z kind of thing at the high school it could have been a perfect split so it was 601 and 602 so what we did was we did a non consecutive alpha split that got us within like just numbers at each one of the schools so you know for example at marathon it might be 301 and 303 like that kind of a perfect split across four schools the fifth school was the middle school and the best we could do was a 20 student difference at the middle school so really our non-alpha split was the way to go. And we did have to find ourselves a delightful engineer to get us that information, but we got it done. That's great. Yeah. Could you tell me what, what did you submit yesterday and where did you submit it? Okay, so that was on the 31st. Okay. That it was submitted and it gets submitted to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. What the commissioner asks is that we have three plans in place. One is a full attendance every day, kind of typical uh, model. And of course you'd still build in things like mask breaks or hand washing breaks, that kind of thing. But um, that, that one presumes that kids could come back full time. And then the second one is you have to offer him a hybrid model. And the one that we have offered to him is the one where kids go every other day. I know people are saying, is that safe? But we can disinfect every classroom every night. So that, that's what we opted for because it promotes the greatest continuity of learning. And then the third one is a fully remote model. And what we have now is sort of the hybrid model and the elect remote model. If we go to fully remote, the kids who are elect remote will stay with those teachers. The kids who are hybrid will stay with those teachers, but everybody will still go remote. 
Um, so that's what I submitted. And the commissioner asked for that because he wants sort of an insurance plan that every district is able to just change on a dime. So if we were in hybrid right now and cases spiked in Hopkinton, we had to go remote, we could do it almost overnight. That's great. Now, uh, right now we're starting in the hybrid model, correct? Some hybrid, some remote. Yes, those who select remote, full remote, have, have were able to do that, and those who selected hybrid will be hybrid. Yeah. I'm just curious, are you, as we get closer to September 16th, and there will be a month or more of other school districts in other parts of the country having started this, is it possible that that could change based upon what you observe in the schools? or? Is that, or is that decision set and we are starting hybrid? That could change any time of day of the year <laughs> ever. Uh, and I'm glad that you've asked that question because you know one of the things that we are seeing now, even across Massachusetts, is that cases are going up. And today is only August 4th. So what will it look like on September 16th when, you know, I mean, we are clearly five weeks away from, from that date. Uh, does it does it give me some pause? It, it really does. Yes. Um, so yeah, we could be starting school on September 16th, fully remote, get, depending upon the trajectory of that virus, not only in the state, but also in the town of Hopkinton. You know, I mean, there could be a million cases over in Framingham, but if in Hopkinton, we still have two active cases, we're going to school. Gotcha. Um, one thing I would like to say, and I say it every time I have an opportunity, and since you're listening, Jim, I'll say it. Um, I, I think it's really important that everyone does their part, you know, because if we had 25 active cases in Hopkinton, even if they are all cases that we say, well, you know, this person looks like they're recovering perfectly well from the virus. Now that still does impact whether or not we open our school doors. So we need to be really cautious if it's the intent of the district to go back to school. All right, excellent. Here's a couple um, probably easy ones, I hope. Okay. Can you speak to the technology requirements and suggestions for the elected remote cohort? Will students be able to borrow devices like in the spring? And that's from Lee. Yes, in fact, I don't know that we ever actually collected the devices that we sent out to families in the spring. Um, I, I believe we did not. I'm thinking that if, um, if any of them came back, they were only coming back for you know, repair or you know, cleaning or something like that. But yes, anybody who needs a, a device, we are absolutely going to ensure that they get one. Great. And Anne asks, can you tell us how many remote classrooms will be at Marathon and will they be full classrooms? So it's hard to say that right now. If we were kind of doing the math and we said, you know, 27 percent, that would probably be the, you know, so you've got, I don't know, 27 times three. What are we talking? Just under 90 kids. So that would probably get us like to four classrooms, I would say, at, at Marathon. Um, but that 27% is district wide. So, you know, we could have like 30% in the eighth grade and only 19% in the first grade. So we have to kind of take a look at that, which is why I think when we, when people are saying, why are we in such a hurry to get this done? We're in a hurry, but there's an awful lot of work to do before a kid crosses the threshold. So, right. Okay. Christopher asks, with asynchronous in that way of HHS example, sounding a bit tougher for teachers than simply live streaming of classrooms to keep both cohorts together. Can you comment on why live streaming is not a good option as you alluded to Thursday evening? Sure. So we, we really think that it is very difficult to be teaching the kids in front of you and also to be kind of cognizant of the fact that you do have that kind of at-home audience, you know, and, and you know that in the back of your mind, you're kind of not checking in with them, but your movements around the room might be restricted. And, um, you know, when you're pushing out that kind of information, 
when you're in your classroom and you're talking to the kids and you're saying things in context and and you don't have to be sort of guarded about what you're saying it it's sort of that really nice flexible negotiable kind of classroom and i guess jim in some way i can liken it to being on your show right so when we are doing a show that we pre-record you know, one of the things we always say to our guests is if you say something that you think, oh, I wish I didn't say that or wow, I really botched that. We can go back and take that out of, you know, the, the recording and then push it out to the Hopkinton community and it goes out not that way. I, I know that a lot of teachers are skeptical or fearful even that, you know, people could take just that little piece of them and, you know, turn that into a loop that gets played over and over and over. And what does that do to them professionally? So, you know, while they are concerned about it, I am too, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, and I feel like there are ways that we can push information out asynchronously. So what parents would like to have live streamed could be pre-recorded by a teacher and sent out just as easily. Okay. Danica asks, how much COVID grant money has HPS been awarded? All right. So the town of Hopkinton did get $1.6 million in COVID restricted funds, but that is for the entire community. Now, do the schools get to spend some money on that? Absolutely. And are we typically the, the most expensive department in the town of Hopkinton? We most assuredly are. Um, but the other thing that has happened is we have been given $225 per student, uh, which is an enormous amount of money. It comes in for us at about just under a million dollars. Uh, and I know that people are thinking, wow, that's an awful lot of money. But we have already spent well over $100,000 just in plexiglass, if that kind of helps people know. And if we're using an AB model and doing deep cleaning, you know, the cleaning supplies and buying additional protective guns and hiring additional cu custodians, it's very, very easy to eat up that $900,000 to ensure safety. Okay. Don asks, will seventh and eighth grade students switch classes for their math and foreign language class and will orchestra still be permitted? Uh, well, I, I think that the, the better way to answer that question is to say, will we be st still be delivering, um, you know, math instruction that is leveled? And the answer to that is yes, we, we are still doing that. Uh, so the physical movement in the middle school will be pretty severely restricted so that if I am a student and I go into my classroom, my English teacher will come in, my math teacher will come in, my science teacher will come in, so that we don't have kids moving from place to place. When the teacher comes into the room, she will wipe her, her area with you know some kind of Lysol wipe that will disinfect the area. And then that will keep kids from having to do that all day too. The other thing that's really nice about that is, you know, Jim, if you and I sit next to each other in a classroom all day and it comes time to do contact tracing, now, my parents and your parents are going to know that we're sitting next to each other. So if you test positive, uh, you know, my, my parents are going to get, you know, some kind of understanding from the DPH that I have been within six feet of a student who has tested positive for the coronavirus. What the commissioner has said is in a classroom where students are going to be sort of all day long in a, as a cohort, the moment one test positive, they are all considered to be part of that cohort. They all go out on quarantine and then they can get tested and come back in as they are tested. Same for the teacher. She would also you know, need to be tested to be able to return to school. Um, otherwise people are out for you know, 10 days on quarantine. And there was the last part of that question it was orchestra. Yeah, no, the commissioner has said that if anyone is going to be, well, maybe orchestra is a little bit different from band, but if anyone is playing a woodwind or a brass instrument, um, they would have to be outside with greater than 10 feet between them. So it would be very tricky to get our kids into, you know, the, the band setting. Um, orchestra might be a little bit different if we could find a place to kind of spread our kids out. We are a little bit worried about our teachers who are specialists because those specialists would not just be seeing 20 kids all day. Well, I shouldn't say 20 kids, 12 kids on an orange day, 12 kids on a green day, or 10 kids on an orange day, 11 kids on a green day. Those teachers could be seeing up to 80 students a day. 
So that really increases their susceptibility, their exposure to potential virus. Right. Kind of following up with what you had been talking about with live streaming, mm -hmm. uh, Kim asked, how would live streaming be different than doing it to everyone through Zoom? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that it is super different, except that the audience is all the same. It's not two different audiences. And sort of, you know, as you are pushing something out, you're probably not going to use Zoom so much for lecture. You know, you can push your, your, le your lecture out asynchronously. And what we had actually asked teachers to do, and this is actually good practice for remote instruction, so earlier when I was talking about, you know, kind of using that model of the To Kill a Mockingbird lesson that went out asynchronously, the kids read independently, they filled out a graphic organizer independently, they got together in a small group of four kids, and then they put something on paper electronically and submitted it to the teacher. Now the teacher can read all of those things, but what she's going to do in that setting is engage in dialogue with the students who have written those either in small group or in a group of like maybe 12 kids either remotely the next day or in person the next day. But that I think is, it's different when you're having those Zoom sessions and people being casual and all of that from I am in my classroom for a 40 minute period teaching my kids and then suddenly somebody is really watching every minute of what I do. It's, it's different. Like I think it would be very different if I'm on the screen having this conversation with you rather than if I you know, walk out into my living room and have the same conversation with my husband, it would be a different kind of conversation. You know, I don't mind people filming me here because there's sort of a great awareness of and what it looks like to me on this screen, but it's very different, I think, if I'm in my classroom doing what I would typically do in the classroom and in my living room doing the kinds of things you typically say and do in your living room. Like there's a forgetfulness, I think, almost about the different audiences. You know, we talk to kids about audience and purpose. You know, you talk differently to your grandmother than you do to your English teacher than you do to your best friend. And I think that those are some of the things I think that live streaming, we're not ready. Okay. I've got three questions here that I'm going to kind of put together and have you respond to, um, to all of them at one time because they're very similar. Uh, first question from uh, Nanda Hindi is talking about if a student switches from hybrid to remote uh, after a month's time, will there be a new set of assignments curriculum? Could you explain how the switch from one model to another might impact the teacher assignments and curriculum? Another, um, Saruba is asking if a high school student does not get the electives like AP or honor as he or she selected, elective remote, uh, learning more, leaning more on safety, will there be any consideration of penalized students, especially junior year where GPA is so important? And Jenica asked, do you anticipate being able to get through the entire curriculum this year, plus catch students up from the spring with an elected remote and hybrid model? I put those three together because I think they're, they're really kind of talking about are we getting what we need to get out there for the curriculum and uh, how is that being handled? Sure. So the first one, if I'm remembering correctly, it's would you be getting two different things? Yeah. No, you should not be getting two different things. If I'm a fourth grade teacher and you know I am supposed to be teaching ELA and math standards and science, all of that should look very, very similar whether you're in brick and mortar or whether you're remote. So in the example I gave at the start of this where you see a kid gets 20 minutes, say for example, of health instruction, and then that person goes into a, an asynchronous and finishes out the lesson. Next week, when that kiddo gets another 20 minutes, you know the, the kids in school might be getting a whole 40 minutes today, but wouldn't get it the next time because their other cohort would be getting it. So if orange got it for 40 and then green got it for 40, at home would get it for 20 and 20, if that's making sense. But we really are looking at the commissioner's guidelines and trying to figure those things out minute by minute. Like how would this absolutely play out? If there's a kid who's a junior who signed up for something like AP chemistry, and let's imagine worst case scenario, which I don't think would happen, but let's imagine that he's the only student who is a remote learner who signed up for AP chemistry. We will work really, really hard to ensure that that kid gets an AP chemistry course. It would be very difficult to imagine that we're not going to be able to accommodate all those needs. But if that were to happen, we would work carefully with families to talk about what options they had 
to be able to ensure that their kids were getting the kinds of courses that they really, really wanted. And can you ask me about Janika's last one again? There was one more thing that you had said about curriculum, the third one. Um, about catching up, making okay. sure that they get everything and get caught up from last year. Yes. You know, and that, well, and this is one of the questions that we had yesterday. The administrators actually had a meeting yesterday and, you know, we were talking about the 60 hours of professional learning that our teachers have before school starts. So if they are coming in on August 31st and they have four days in the first week, four days in the second week and two days in the third week, by the time we get to, I think the 16th is a Wednesday, they've had their 10 days, but what are the administrators doing in that time? And we were even thinking that some members of the administrative team could bring some kids in and get some preliminary testing done just to have a sense of where kids are, you know, if families would agree to coming in and helping out the administrators with that. So her question or his question is a very good question uh, because we are in that, that funny place of how much learning loss was there. We're really, really not sure. And so what we're trying to, to kind of figure out is, um, you know, and we will actually start with the next grade level curriculum, but we'll have a much better sense of how much time should we spend or devote to, you know, some of those skills that may be really prerequisite skills that have to go forward. Um, in a, a survey that we had done, um, it was asked if you felt like you, for teachers, did they feel like they were able to get through what the commissioner had said were the must haves? Without this, you shouldn't go to the next level. So we have that data too. And Great. that's really anecdotal-ish kind of from the teacher. Mm. Okay. Um, Mamta asks, for kindergartners who selected full remote, will Zoom attendance be mandatory? With working parents and low attention span of five-year-olds, will it be okay if they completed their assignments on time and maybe used the teacher recordings? Absolutely. Kindergarten is not mandated in Massachusetts. So, I mean, we'll take attendance because we don't want to lose any children. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's always important for us to, you know, if a student stops showing up, we just want to make sure that, you know, the kiddo's still there. Hi, how are you? Check in, good social, emotional, all of that. Um, but, but no, we cannot mandate kindergarten in Massachusetts. Okay. Krista asked, this should be a quick one. With the elections you received for hybrid versus remote, Will there be enough space to socially distance kids in our schools? Absolutely. Yes, there will. Um, you know, we've obviously reduced the cohorts by 50%. And then if we think about there being, you know, maybe another, I don't know, 13%-ish of those groups that aren't coming in each day, it should be very easy for us to socially distance. And we have, you know, obviously the commissioner has asked us to engage in gap closing measures. So there are some students who would be invited to come into school every day. And even adding those students in there, the six feet of social distancing should be readily doable. Okay. Uh, Jenica reminded me of the second part of her question. Can you also get through the entire curriculum this year with the hybrid remote models? Hmm. Well, one of the things that we have said about so looking at the hybrid, if I have kids in school and I'm able to do all the things that I normally would, the important thing, and I say this you know, to anyone who will listen, for teachers to think about is if it were a typical school year and I had my kids coming in the next day, so go back to my Kill a Mockingbird thing, and I wanted to really illustrate how Harper Lee is showing the different value systems of those two families. How would I get my kids to do that in class? And maybe what we would do is we'd all put the desks in a circle and we would dialogue about it and then talk about passages from the book. But because we're not in a brick and mortar setting, I've got to think about another way to make that happen. So I'm going to have kids take the graphic organizer, pull out the text we would normally talk about it, put it in the organizer, get together in small groups and talk about it. And then as a small group, write about it. What we know about writing is cognitively, it's the most complex thing that you do. So if kids can think about it and then read about it and then talk about it and then write about it, they should have a good chunk of it when they come back in the next day. Now, if you go for 180 days and you're really trying to think hard, how would I push out what I was gonna do in school? Maybe we're not gonna get 180 days worth, but I'm thinking that we could get 160 days worth if we really, really planned our instruction carefully. And, you know, so I, we're Hopkinton 
and we have really smart, good teachers, and we have instructional leaders as building principals who are darn good at that, and SMLs and CTLs embedded kind of, you know, in our infrastructure. I am confident that what we are pushing out will be better than what most districts are able to do. Awesome. Uh, Diana asks, do you plan on sharing the number of positives classrooms quarantined each month? Have so, you thought about it? <laughs> yeah. No, here's here. People have asked this question. And I think that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be sharing that information, I don't think, with parties that didn't need to have that information, for example. So if a second grade classroom has a second grader who tests positive, the other 11 kids who are part of that green cohort, the moms and dads will all get a phone call saying, you know, your child has been exposed to somebody who is COVID, COVID positive, or the kid who sits within six feet, eight feet, 10 feet of him on the bus will get a phone call saying your child has been. Uh, but you know what, I, I'm not necessarily sure that we need to push that information out about a grade level or a building because those students will be easily identifiable. You know, when you walk past the classroom and see that it's empty, we'll say it was one of the kids in that room. And you know, for you know, HIPAA purposes and confidentiality purposes, we would probably not be doing that. Okay. I know that's a hard one because everybody asks me that one. Oh no, I, it's everybody's interested in that. I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Heather asked, will students with IEPs who go the full in-person route stay with the same cohort, or will they switch back and forth from the orange and green cohort on the days that they go to school? Yes. So if you are, let's break this right into a, a classroom teacher. Let's imagine that um, I'm in third grade and my teacher is Mrs. O'Malley uh, at the Elmwood School. Mrs. O'Malley's class that would have been, if there weren't a pandemic, say 21 students, is now broken into 10 kids on an orange cohort and 11 kids on a green cohort. Half the class comes one day the other half of the class comes the next day. So what would happen to a student who is on an IEP who chooses to come every day? That person would come with green cohort peers on Monday and orange cohort peers on Tuesday to Mrs. O'Malley's classroom. Now, would that kid sit through the exact same thing that he had sat through the day before? No, because what we would be doing is on the second day, delivering different special education services, engaging in additional reading instruction, those kinds of things so that we are sure that what we're really doing is closing the gap and not boring the life out of that child, right? We don't want to see him sit through the same thing twice. What we want to do is build his skills. Okay. Um, James asks, a friend of mine was thinking of applying to become a substitute teacher at the high school. Do you think it would be worth his while to apply? I would ask how many friends does James have? Because yes, we need as many substitutes as we can get across the district. We are thinking that would be super helpful. Yes. Uh, Mamta asks, for eighth graders, will kids in accelerated math still be taught accordingly? They will still be taught accordingly. Now, if it's the hybrid model, you know, they'll have a day in and a day of remote, and a day in and a day re of remote. Okay. Uh, Heather actually had a follow-up when you were um, asking her a question about the I, answering a question about the IEPs. And she asked um, if you could give a middle school example. All right, so we did meet with the middle school special education team. And I think that we have kind of put this out also on, on social media. So if I'm a student who comes into the middle school, you know, I may have some time with my special education liaison. I may have some time to work with a paraprofessional. I may have some time to be taking what would be my pushed out asynchronous learning and work with two or three peers, either in the classroom or in another setting. And you know what? Maybe I do want to sit through that math lecture one more time. So I really could stay in the classroom for math because that's the one that is, you know, the one that I feel like I haven't quite wrapped my head around because yesterday I didn't get it the first time. Um, so there are lots of different options. I think the one thing I keep telling parents um, of students on IEPs is that a lot of what is built into the day that is your would have normally been your at home day, that's going to depend on precisely what your student needs when he or she walks in that door on that day. Okay. Um, we got a question. Who is in charge of the basketball court at the middle school, high school? 
why are there teenagers playing in large groups with no social distancing daily? If the MSHS is in charge, what is the message being sent? Okay, so that's a fine question. And um, in the summertime, when the schools are not in session, the school district does not govern those. It's more of a municipal responsibility, I, I would call it. So I know that many people have reached out to the Department of Public Health, and we've had meetings recently between the Chief of Police, the Department of Public Health, and I know that the Health Department, Public Health Department was even going to reach out to some of the coaches in the community. Uh, the Department of Public Health Per Charlie, uh, Governor Charlie Baker's uh, order actually has the ability to shut those courts down. You know, we could go out there and take down the backboards and the hoops and just leave nothing but concrete and you know poles erected there. But what they had decided to do, I believe, was to work through an educative kind of process first, like really try to educate people on on what why what they're doing is so dangerous. You know. Um, the health director has spoken to me about it and has talked about, you know, if my face and your face are very close to each other and we're breathing hard and spits coming out of our mouth and we're exchanging sweat, all of those things are, you know, not going to mitigate that virus, but rather spread it. So we really are thinking um, that it's time for us to do something about those basketball courts. In the summertime, I see my role as being someone who can push information out to the community because, you know, we have school messenger that reaches thousands of families literally thousands. Okay. Exposure can go well beyond the classroom. Kids interact with other kids in their neighborhood, their family activities. What is the notification end and who will notify all those other extraneous people? I'm interested to hear how the school is interfacing with the community. Yeah. So, I mean, we can only continue to say to families, please, practice social distancing, put your masks on. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to be absolutely no fun, but you could certainly do things as a neighborhood with you know, six feet of social distancing. If kids are riding bikes on the cul-de-sac, that's, that's fine. If someone decides that they're going to have sort of an outdoor fire in their fire pit, that seems to me to be like one of those activities you could do safely. Um, so I, I guess I would just encourage families to think about what is safe to do. Um, when or if a person ends up testing COVID positive, it's the Department of Public Health that does the contact tracing. So if it you know, happened that a third grader who lives on that particular cul-de-sac hangs out with two friends there all the time, uh, not only would that kid's classroom all be notified, but I'm sure that the two families who live next door and the information is shared about you know at home with the DPH through the parents. So the parents would say, my child also hangs out with student A and student B who live to the right of us and the left of us. Okay. Um, this one I know is pretty easy. Uh, can we shift to hybrid from remote or vice versa anytime during the school year or end of semester? So what we're doing is if you if we start on September 16th, which is a Wednesday, we'll choose a date probably two weeks in, say for example, October 1st makes great sense. And that would be a transition day. So if you've looked at where you are right now and you say, you know what, I chose remote and I am very unhappy or I chose hybrid and this is not working out for my family, um, you can make that switch round about October 1st. Um, after that, and that goes even for our kids who said, well, I would really want to take this tech class online or an Edmentum class online. In the first couple of weeks, we will let you drop that course legitimately. After that, what we're going to do is have, you know, two or three dates on which those would be transition dates. So maybe the next one is November 1st, say for example, and that's absolutely hypothetical. It's not carved in stone. At that point, you could make a switch. But if I'm that junior who is taking the AP chemistry course online in a VHS setting, and I've been doing that since September 16th, and now I'm six weeks in, I'm staying with that VHS course. I could still come into Hopkinton High School and take an in-person English class, an in-person social studies class, but during my VHS time, I'm going to sit in a place in Hopkinton High School, log in and take my online VHS course. Okay, we are rapidly coming up. We've done a really good job getting through a lot of these questions. Uh, James had, had a couple that kind of uh, go together. Do you feel that per any permanent teacher wants to physically be in any classroom five days a week? And are there enough teachers who feel comfortable that are ready to teach in school? I don't know if that is a negotiation thing that you're working through now or not. 
it is sort of a negotiation thing that we're working on. Um, and, you know, there are obviously like labor laws that, that govern some of this, you know, so some people would in fact qualify under the American Disabilities Act for accommodations. And then what happens is we engage with teachers in what we call an interactive dialogue. We talk about what the doctor has said. We talk about what the accommodations that they might need are. And, you know, we kind of go from there. Because we have 27% of our students who have indicated that they would like to be taught remotely. You know, now what we do is we start, and this is another reason why we have to get going with this, is that not only are we creating school student schedules, but for every one of those classrooms where we say 20 students are going to gather to learn math, we've got to have a math teacher in there. So we've got to really work with the teachers association to figure out who's coming in and who's going to be where. Okay. Here's an interest when Nicole asked, uh, when you were just talking about going back and forth between at home, uh, going remote, and um, the hybrid model. Nicole asks, does the same opt-in, opt-out timing hold true for transportation? So what, where we are right now, um, the transportation numbers actually look very good. Right now, um, I, because we have three different bus runs and we have 31 buses and 26 kids in each one of those buses, we're actually in pretty good shape. Now, I understand that families' situations are going to change. And so if we have room in the bus that goes right past your house, absolutely, we can get your student on that bus. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, you know, if your bus has already 26 kids in it, we may have to do something else. But mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, wrapping this up, we got a couple people who are also asking, and I know you mentioned this, but I just thought we could just mention this again at the end. Uh, although we under Laura says, although we understand it's a little too a little premature. When will we know what groups and classes are our kids place? And uh, Radhika asked, any approximate date to know when groups our kids will be placed? Uh, I'm going to refrain from giving any dates right now because we really do not know the magnitude of of the job to get everybody in place. So you know, I can give you a, a good example of what an elementary principal is up against, and then I can give you a good example of what the secondary principal is up against. In one so, minute. One minute. So if I am Mrs. Carver and I had a beautiful class all set and now I look at the alpha split and I have 18 and four, I'm in trouble, right? So I can't have 18 kids in my green cohort and three in my, or four in my orange. So she's got to straighten that out. And then she's got to make sure that she takes care of all her, her kids on IEPs and English language learners and teachers and all that. But if I'm Mr. Bishop, I'm in really big trouble because by the time you get to junior and senior year, there are hundreds and hundreds of different schedules up there that he's got to remake. Literally hundreds. Right. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carol. I want to say we did really well. Here's a really easy one to wrap it up. Okay. We have 15 seconds. It's my so wrap. if my son chose band as an elective in the middle school, does he have to choose another? No, because we can work on things like you play your musical instrument outside of school, but we work on fingering and music reading and all of that kind of stuff in school. So no, your child does not have to. Okay, thank you so much. You did a great job. I only have five questions left to forward to all at right. the end. I look forward to seeing you next week. Next thank week. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for joining us and see you tomorrow on the Hangout Hour.